Welcome to the second half of chapter 4. In the first half we saw how the FDA's quality system model addressed many of the issues raised by the deployment of traditional GMP as our quality management system base and was sponsoring a necessary evolution of thought process. In this chapter we will take the matter forward and concentrate on the work of the International Conference on Harmonization and consider the ramifications of this work. The International Conference on Harmonization is a collection of the world's leading regulatory authorities. Sitting on the ICH panel include representatives of the EU, USA and Japan, plus other countries and areas. Historically, the ICH have produced guidelines that support GMP and marketing applications for new products. In the past 10 years, they have produced three guidelines that have ramifications for pharmaceutical quality management. These are called ICHQ 8, 9 and 10. The Q is because they belong to their family of quality guidelines, rather than the ICH safety or efficacy guidelines. Of particular note to us will be ICHQ 10, Pharmaceutical Quality Systems. For the sake of completeness, however, we will quickly cover the principles of ICHQ 8 and 9 first. ICHQ 8 covers pharmaceutical development, an activity not covered in GMP, as GMP starts once a product has been developed. A copy of ICHQ 8 can be found in the attachments part of this presentation. It is not necessary to read it and is only provided for reference. In essence, the focus of ICHQ 8 is about getting to us understand a new product more at the last stages of its development before it is transferred to a manufacturing facility. If done, this may allow a greater degree of flexibility with the finished product specifications. ICHQ 9 covers quality risk management and provides, for the first time, details about how you may perform risk management within a pharmaceutical environment. Risk management in itself is dealt with in a later unit. ICHQ 10 covers pharmaceutical quality systems and is very much the ICH is equivalent to the FDA's quality system model that was discussed at Chapter 4a. Whilst the FDA's document may not be of direct relevance to you, especially if you do not supply the USA market, ICHQ10 is relevant as it has become a formal part of EU GMP. Both documents offer a good insight into how you could evolve a GMP-based quality system to one that links with the needs of the whole business. A copy of ICHQ10 can be found in the attachments part of this presentation. Open up and or print this document. While it's not as well structured as the FDA's Quality Management System document, a cursory look at the document's Table of Contents, see the slide, will again though show a marked and immediate similarity to the principal themes associated with both the FDA model and the ISO-based system model. In the first section of ICHQ10, something of a preamble, Section 1, pharmaceutical quality system, it straight away points to the need to at 152 maintain a state of control and at 153 facilitate continual improvement. This shows that first and foremost pharmaceutical manufacturers must be in control, very much the spirit of GMP, but almost straight away states that this is not enough, with a following clause on continual improvement. It talks of, at 161, knowledge management, and at 162, quality risk management, and the need for, at 1.8, a quality manual. Here again, and for the first time in GMP, the ISO requirement of the quality manual arriving, a high-level document that describes the QMS. Section 2, on management responsibility, includes subsections concerned with 2.1 Management Commitment 2.2 Quality Policy 2.3 Quality Planning 
2.4 resource management, 2.5 internal communication and at 2.6 management review. You will know by now that these requirements are also from ISO 9001. At section 3 we have continual improvement of process performance and product quality which rather speaks for itself. Whilst section 4 continual improvement of the pharmaceutical quality system covers at 4.1 management review of the pharmaceutical quality system and 4.2 monitoring factors impacting on the quality system. All of these are activities that are new to traditional GMP and are essentially taken from the ISO model. Perhaps clause 4.2 will look at some of these factors outside the scope of GMP we have mentioned many times. Again, if we compare the ICHQ 10 model with that of the ISO model, seen in Chapter 1 of this unit, we can see now how we begin to address matters that were something of a previous concern, principally related to the role of top management at management commitment, and the pursuit of both product and process improvement, measurement, analysis and improvement. Text in red indicates clauses of ISO that historically have not been covered by GMP. Now we can see many of these things being covered in GMP via ICHQ 10 and the FDA's quality system model. If you have not already read the ICHQ 10 document, it will be worthwhile having a look at it. It tries to look at the bigger picture of medicines and considers the whole life cycle of a product, from pharmaceutical development, technology transfer, commercial manufacturing and eventual product discontinuation. Like the FDA's quality system model, it has a great focus on processes, continual improvement and the role of top management to own and develop their QMS. From a personal perspective and as the course tutor, I do not feel that ICHQ10 is a well constructed and easy to understand document, whereas whilst not being perfect, the FGA equivalent is much easier to understand. So what are the repercussions of these developments that we have looked at in Chapter 4 as a whole? In this session, we have introduced two significant documents that are formally moving pharmaceutical quality management system thinking forwards, the FDA's quality system model and ICHQ10 moving quality thinking in the direction that some other industries were adopting over 10 years ago. A lot of the ideas introduced in this session are common sense and good business practice. As we have stated earlier, it may be that your own organisation is doing these things. If they are not, then it is likely that your QMS may need to start evolving in line with new regulatory expectations. These documents give us a new baseline. If you are already doing these things, are they being done in areas outside of the traditional GMP areas? If not, then again, your QMS may need to start expanding to cover departments and or functions that are outside the scope of traditional GMP, but can have an impact on product quality and level of service. Finally, there is a very pragmatic matter that we must consider. The more formal repercussions associated with this evolutionary process thus far. EU GMP has now been restructured into three parts, with both ICHQ9 and Q10 moving into part 3 of GMP. See the slide. Whilst the contents of part 3 of GMP are not compulsory, they are seen as best practice and their contents will be included, bit by bit, into subsequent future updates of the chapters and annexes of GMP. This can be demonstrated in the recently, 2013, updated Chapter 1 of GMP and includes new requirements added to previous ones. In the attachments part of this presentation, you will see the new update to EU GMP Chapter 1 coming into operation in early 2013. 
open up and or print this document. Have a brief scan of this new chapter and we will run through its requirements in more detail shortly. The requirements for quality assurance, clause 1.4, or the pharmaceutical quality system are now more extensive and a number of new quality concepts make their way into GMP for the first time. These include reference to processes and process knowledge, continual improvement and root cause analysis, all indicative of the fact that GMP's thinking on quality management is evolving along the lines seen in many other industries and in line with contemporary quality management system thinking. Traditional GMP told us that QA therefore incorporates GMP plus factors outside the scope of this guide. We are beginning to be told perhaps what these factors actually are. In addition, the new update to EU GMP Chapter 1 has many new clauses covering the requirements for top management and commitment of all staff. This may not mean anything new to most organisations, but GMP is now formally stating for the first time that quality and the QA system is the responsibility of everyone, and not just the QA manager or QA department. This is important for two reasons. Firstly, staff at all levels need an understanding of the importance of quality and the quality system. Secondly, top management run an organisation. They determine priorities, clarify what work needs to be done and provide the resources, human, equipment and financial, to make things happen. If top management are not committed, then things rarely happen. This inclusion of top management in more detail in Chapter 1 of GMP shows a formal evolution in pharmaceutical quality management thinking, that of linking the QMS with the needs of the whole business, top management's business. At this point, we would like you to have a look at certain clauses of Chapter 1 that relate to what we have been saying. The clauses of relevance are clauses 1.2 and 1.3 and clauses 1.5, 1.6 and 1.7. If you have not already done so, read these now. The essence of these clauses are summarised here and present a feel for the direction in which pharmaceutical QMS thinking is evolving. They formally introduce many new concepts to GMP. Clause 1.2 states that GMP doesn't just start and finish at the pharmaceutical manufacturing site and that its requirements should be considered at all stages of a product's life cycle, from design to discontinuation. Also note the first ever mention of continual improvement in GMP. Clause 1.3 states that the QMS should be appropriate for the size and complexity of an organisation and risk factors should be considered. A QMS should focus more on areas of higher risk than areas of lower risk. Clause 1.5 brings in the first true mention of the role and importance of senior management and their leadership. It also stipulates their active involvement in the QMS. Clause 1.6 states again the role of senior management, this time stating the importance of them being involved in reviewing and improving the whole system. Finally, Clause 1.7 brings in for the first time the requirement to describe the QMS in a document called a quality manual. This should provide a high level overview of how the QMS works. In total, a lengthy chapter and one where we have seen how ISO has been fundamental in sponsoring the more recent developments in pharmaceutical QMS thinking via either the FDA or ICH models. Additionally, in adopting either the FDA model or the ICH model as either a design criteria baseline or improvement baseline, we begin to address those numerous concerns about the adequacy of traditional GMP. In Unit 1, and in previous chapters, we have asked whether or not our system provides us with the necessary assurance we need, and whether or not it meets the requirements set by the current economic climate.
we also asked whether or not our current system can evolve and does it actually promote development and improvement and embrace contemporary quality and quality management system thinking. And finally, we asked if our current system promotes effectiveness and efficiency through not only the manufacturing process, but also other processes that can impact on product quality and therefore hinder our performance. A fairly large part, both of the FDA and ICH system models, begin to sponsor an evolutionary journey and a journey in the right direction.